you to this present session on ancient education and sciences. Uh, here in this uh, uh, speakers, Professor uh, Rajiv Srinivasan is present. And then uh, Professor K. Damodaran and Professor N. Uh, Komareth. They are also present, I think, here. And Srimati Sahana Singh, she is present here. And uh, Nisha Patil, Dr. Nisha Patil, you are there. So these uh, four papers will be in this uh, present session. So before they are uh, preparing, let me say about this, uh, few words about this uh, session, yeah. Education and Sciences. So this education and sciences uh, both are very much yeah, connected. One, one, one. I myself, I am Professor Rao. I am professor in yeah. JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Yeah. I okay. teach Sanskrit and Pali in School of Sanskrit and Indic Studies. Uh, education, when you speak about education in waves like conference, so we have uh, ancient education system and medieval system and modern education system, you know, all of you. But in ancient education, you will find okay. in Upanishads. Good shape. Thank you. That Sa vidya ya vimuktaye, he said. That was the education. Once upon a time, that was quite different. Now we cannot follow those things. We all know that. And later on, there are so many things about education in Sanskrit. So vidya dadati vinayam. Education is called vidya in Sanskrit. In Hindi, they call it siksha. But in Telugu, siksha means punishment. <laughs> These are all different. <laughs> siksha. Because recently one parliament, uh, one, uh, one parliament member from Karnataka, he was, he should get siksha, he was telling. But he, his, his opinion is he should get punishment. But everybody understood he should get education. <laughs> <laughs> you, that uh, from Congress MP, I forgot, Mallikarjun, he was telling like that. So, <laughs> education, vidya dadati vinayam. This is very important stanza. Everybody knows, but every, nobody follows this. Very popular verse in Sanskrit. Vidya dadati vinayam, vinayat yati patratam, patratvat dhanam apnoti, dhanat dharmam tatas sukham. These are gradual steps. Vidya gives education, humility, humble nature. Otherwise, it is not education. It's very, very important factor. You can see all educated people today, they are not humble. Everybody is so arrogant. <laughs> so, but Vidya Dadati Vinayam, education gives the humility and after getting humility, Vinayat Yati Patrata, he will be capable, able, one, he will get one status in society, Patratam, Patratam mil jati hai unko. That is, he get the one uh, uh, deserving uh, character in, in society to live. Patri. Otherwise, he cannot be deserving, he is not deserving without humility. That's the meaning. Vinayad yati patrata patratva dhana apnoti when he becomes able, capable and deserving person, he will slowly earn the money also. Dhana apnoti. Apnoti means he is get, he will get. Dhanat dharma. After getting money, what he has to do? He should perform righteous activities. Dharma he should follow. Dhanat dharma. Because even for performing dharma, he needs money. Because you have to do various rituals, various asterisks. All this involves money. Particularly Hinduism involves so, so many ceremonies, so many flowers, so many fruits. That is one of the problems now in Indonesia. Many Hindus become, are becoming, when I went there recently few times, I just told them, don't make that very, very strict Hinduism. Otherwise, they all, they all told me personally, many people, that following Hinduism is very, very problematic because we have many ceremonies. So much money is needed. So we had to modify according to time. So that is for dharma, we need money. Dhana dharma, tata sukham. After performing dharma, one gets happiness. So this is the education. And also education and science are both are interconnected in India. Science and education both are not different. One thing I said very briefly, because there are so many presenters here, presentators. In our ancient India, all Sanskrit texts, we did not have the division of this uh, subjects like science, chemistry, physics, all were there in one text. So slowly, slowly we started dividing the education. Uh, like in universities, we have science is different, commerce, arts. It was not like that in ancient India. We had all these things one single book. So those who go to Gurukulas and study these books, uh, these texts, the literature, 
they used to become experts in all fields in same time so that was our system so education science are interconnected in those days science is not separately it is not taught we have scientific books more so many books in sanskrit literature but they are all in literature you will often find in very beautiful literature of course we have pure science books like bhaskara acharya's book leelavati we have pure science but they are also beautiful in verses science not means not like very dry grammar also is so 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 much very 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 uh, attractive in sanskrit that is why we say yadyapi bahuna adhishe tathapi pathaputra vyakaranam swajana swajano ma bhut sakalam shakalam sakut shakrut so means uh, even though you are not studying so much at least oh my son you study grammar minimum <laughs> requirement otherwise swajana swajano ma bhut if you instead of saying swajana if you say swajana swajana means our people swajana shwa means a dog in sanskrit <laughs> dog people it becomes that is the meaning instead of sakalam if you say shakalam many many regions they speak like that even in india in they cannot pronounce it, dental sa they just replace it palatal sha or shakalam they say but that is <laughs> but if you say <laughs> shakalam yeah, just negative meaning it gives shakalam is whole shakalam is part tukda shakalam sakrut means once if you say shakrut 100 times sakrut means once shakrut means 100 times so these are that is why you should know minimum that is the beauty or complication also in sanskrit language if you just replace with small letters they give different meaning so therefore the sanskrit literature is in in the world as per my because i studied sanskrit from my childhood uh, uh we speak and we write everything we do in sanskrit in india and also i went many other countries i know some other literatures also i can say there is no literature like sanskrit literature there is no language like sanskrit language in the world that is our greatest treasure that's why uh, the why i am telling all these things many people now here also are very much attracted to sanskrit but nobody really want to study sanskrit this is also one of the factor <laughs> that's why we say don't praise sanskrit you learn sanskrit then you understand what is india so that we say bharatasya pratishthe dve sanskritam sanskriti tatha india has only two great things one is sanskrit language other is indian culture so sanskrit having such a beautiful literature and such a beautiful language and very very miraculous so that everybody indians should know that unfortunately due to our education system in india and particularly in some states like in the andhra pradesh and they just people think that they, everybody knows their sanskrit but people are neglecting sanskrit there everybody is studying computer science engineering and they are also coming to america you are now here you are realizing that importance of sanskrit here so these are all important factors and mainly we should know when you say about the sanskrit and sciences you should understand sanskrit language also because sanskrit is a treasure which we have but we don't know we are sitting on the treasure and we are begging others once you know that you understand that you are sitting on the treasure you will never beg others you start to dig up you that treasure the treasure and you will realize what is there inside so that is the greatness of india greatness of india lies in sanskrit undoubtedly we have also prakrit and pali languages they are also equally very great but they are all interconnected ancient indian languages so these are all very important things now uh, i'm sorry to take so much time i invite uh, you are ready i think professor uh, rajiv srinivasan he will uh, present his paper on rethinking indian education for innovation and uh, a proposal for a pilot thank you very much thank you thank you chairman how much time do i have 20 minutes okay 20 minutes all right what did you say Okay. Um you mentioned uh, Mr. Chairman that one should be humble uh, as a result of education. Every time I come to events like this I become extremely humble because I don't understand Sanskrit, right? And I talk to somebody like Dr. Kak, every time I talk to him I'm really humble. I, mean, I don't mean it negatively. The only Sanskrit I know 
is from Malayalam and Malayalam has got a lot of Sanskrit so I understand a few words. Unfortunately, I cannot tell if it's Rama kill Ravana or Ravana kill Rama. I just know there's Rama and Ravana and kill. So I'm, I'm a victim of our education system, literally, okay? Because I studied in all kinds of places, did a very technical education, but I'm not a complete, uh, uh, you know, a complete person that I could have been if I were much more involved in the humanities. And that's what I'm going to talk about. How we have gone down a path in India, which at least in hindsight, turns out to have been a pretty poor path. But fortunately, we are at a point where we can sort of recoup and uh, revive some of the proper educational heritage that we have let go to uh, rot. Okay, so um, this is my agenda. I'm going to look at basically three topics. One is, what is the current state of Indian education? And it's very obvious from anecdotal, uh, uh, from anecdotes that it's in bad shape. But there is, you know, also evidence, technical evidence and data that shows that it's in terrible shape. And it's interesting to spend a minute or two wondering how we got there. And the second topic is, what's going to happen for um, the future of work? What are workers in the near future, I don't even mean you know, 50 years away, in the next 15, 20 years, what do people need to know? And it's not the same thing that they have been studying or teaching us for the last uh, 50, 70 years. I spent a little bit of time on the impact of education technology, or rather edutech on education. And finally, um, I'd like to make a, a little bit of a plug for introducing some traditional content back into our education, right? So that's what I'll talk about. So these three points, um, uh, an analysis of what's gone wrong and why, and secondly, what could be done, and thirdly, something practical, okay? So what is the role of education? That's something that uh, we've heard a lot about here, including right now by, from the chair. But there are many issues that are obvious to people who are living in India for sure, and I'm sure Many of you are uh, aware of these things. We have a few islands of excellence, but it's an absolute sea of mediocrity. The average Indian graduate knows nothing, essentially, right? And the companies that hire them have to teach them all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Secondly, there have been really negative things. The Right to Education Act, the 93rd Amendment, and so forth have destroyed whatever was left of it. And um, I also look at this as something that is impacting on our grand narrative. I'll talk about that in a minute. But mother tongue education, I never used to think mother tongue education was very important, but I have a friend named Sankrat Sanu, so, whom some of you may know. He's been evangelizing it for a long time. Now I've become, become a convert. I think we should be teaching our doctors and our lawyers and so forth in the mother tongue, because that's the only way that the languages will survive and thrive. Secondly, that's the only way people can really understand what you're saying to them and uh, what, 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 uh, thank you, what, uh, um, uh, you know, what's going on. Now, the big picture is that, as you all know, India is growing rapidly, and there is a G2 now. The Chinese and the Americans have made it a G2. I think it's going to be a G3 very soon. You know, India doesn't have to do anything extraordinary. Just keep growing at this rate. We're now the number five power in the world in terms of GDP. In the next 20 years, we will be number three. In fact, I'm of the opinion that we can be number two. We can probably overtake the Americans. That, although that's blasphemous to say here, I suppose, but India could potentially do that. And are we ready? It's not enough to have economics. There's got to be a narrative, which is politics, um, you know, governance, all kinds of things. And that's what's happened with both the Protestant narrative and the Confucian narrative. There has to be a grand Indian narrative, which could be a Dharmic narrative or a Hindu narrative. Rajiv Malhotra, who, uh, he's written a book recently about that. That's an important uh, uh, future event that we need to pay attention to. But to get there, we need to realize that we need to stand on our own, own two feet. You know, in general, I don't believe any country has become great by being a shadow of somebody else. India is a shadow of the British and to some extent of the Americans. This cannot continue. We have to have our own personality, including language. I used to think that English was actually a um, benefit to us. Now I think it's an albatross. English is killing us, actually. Okay? 
And I don't want, uh, you know, I would hope that education doesn't stop us from rising as a great power. So what are the symptoms? If you look at um, our universities, um, you know, I think the Indian middle class has done a tremendous job in hijacking the education budget towards tertiary education, university education, whereas the East Asian countries concentrated on primary education, which has been very helpful for them in their industrial growth, right? So we have a lot of uh, fairly crummy primary and secondary education institutions, but it turns out that our tertiary education institutions are also crummy. And the result of that is that I challenge you to come up with a single world-class result from Indian research since 1947. What is ironic and really sad is that before 1947, we had, you know, Srinivasa Ramanujan. We, we had uh, Subramaniam Chandrasekhar. We had, you know, C.V. Raman. We had J.C. Bose and we had uh, uh, S.N. Bose. These were geniuses, world-class people. What do we have since then? Not one. <coughs> Professor Kak can probably tell you one, the uh, prime number algorithm at uh, IIT Kanpur, but that's sort of a, uh, an outlier, okay? And it's a teaching shop, that's what it is. And uh, there are some areas in which we don't even exist. We don't have a presence at all in engineering and physics to some extent, but biotechnology, we're zero, okay? And furthermore, the PISA results are startling. You know, they did, PISA is a secondary education measure and they did that over, I think, in 45 countries in 2013. India was 43rd. It's really bad. And after that, India refused to join the PISA evaluation. Okay? All right, moving on. So what's happened is that, you know, even the educational um, system that is prevalent in the rest of the world is being accused of having poor outcomes. Uh, even in that cohort, we are falling behind. But the other part of it is that our education system is failing our people because we don't end up having leaders. We're sepoys, coolies, etc. Okay? We don't have creativity. Here are some numbers. If you look at the outcomes, it's a little bit hard for you to see. India, uh, as a low-income, middle-income country, is playing far below its weight. Look at the Chinese. They're doing considerably better. And here's another even more startling result, which shows that, you know, the uh, left axis or the, the y-axis shows how much um, advanced education or test results we show in, in India. And you can see zero. You can see the little uh, numbers at the side. If you can see that, it says y-axis India is at zero. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, x-axis India is at zero, whereas you compare that to China. So th there, that means there's a whole lot more people who are taking on advanced education in China than in India. This is pathetic, okay? So how do we get here? My belief is that there are two reasons. One is the Industrial Revolution, right? And the second is an attempt by imperialists to convert India. These photographs are from uh, the famous Apple ad where you had Big Brother and so forth, okay? And the first Industrial Revolution was about dark satanic mills, and I just put that up there partly because of the evangelistic uh, connotation. Ananda Kumaraswamy said something, and I don't have the time to read it, but in effect he was saying an educated Indian is no longer an Indian. You know, he can spout Shakespeare, but he doesn't know anything about Kalidasa, and so on. And this was true in the 1920s when he said it, it's equally true now. There's another uh, quote from James Mill, who was talked about earlier. He was a complete bigot, okay, and a racist. But he said something very interesting. He said the right thing for the wrong reasons. He said Indians should have mother tongue education because he thought Indians were not worthy of English education. But in, in reality, he's right. We should be doing mother tongue education anyway. So that brings me to the second topic. What does the future of work look like? This is the past or the current you know, example of work. This is Charlie Chaplin in modern times. You're a cog in a big machine, right? All of you who have been employees can uh, relate to this. This is the fourth industrial revolution man, a guy who, or a gal, who wears a lot of hats, who's a renaissance person, right? And how do we get there? What's happening is that the first industrial revolution depended on large numbers of barely literate people who could just follow orders, okay? Not enough anymore. The fourth industrial revolution needs people who can think for themselves, be very creative. The second part of it is that 
the organizational form of the multinational corporation was created to lower costs, transaction costs. Those have started collapsing anyway. So I think we will move to a new mechanism, which is pretty much the gig economy. People will not be attached to a company. They'll be attached to their profession. So whenever there is a job, a bunch of people will show up, do it, and then they'll move on, right? Consultants, contractors. So the idea, the very idea of a job may not last for very long. The gig economy, as you know, is big. Um, and then many of the jobs that people are doing now will simply disappear through automation, right? There was uh, an Oxford study that said 47% of American jobs will disappear. It's much worse for India. This is the result. 69% of Indian jobs will disappear, they claim, over the next 20 years. Why? Because machines are now capable of doing many of the cognitive jobs that uh, people have been working in as well. You know, engineering or medicine or law and so forth. The only jobs that will remain are the creative jobs. Are we teaching our children how to survive in a world that needs creativity? Absolutely not. Okay? The new kinds of skills, and I won't go through this list. These I got from some education uh, papers. And they're talking about a lot of socio-emotional skills. But we concentrate on the cognitive skills, right? And that's a no-no. Here is a list of the skills that are most in demand. Please note that not one of them is a technical skill. Not one. They're emotional skills. They are psychological skills, critical thinking, creativity, etc. right? This means our education is not only failing us now, it's going to fail us, our children in the future as well. OK. Now, there are some technology advances I'd like to look at briefly. One is using data analytics and uh, machine intelligence, you can have highly targeted instruction. You know, you can find out exactly what a kid is good at and nurture those latent talents. What he's good at and what he's bad at, you can figure out and you can give him appropriate curricula, which means you can customize it extremely um, thoroughly down to the individual student, which I imagine is what a gurukula used to have, where a guru could understand what you were good at and they could direct you in that direction. Um, so there'll be a lot of change from this kind of AI and uh, data analytics. Second is MOOCs, massive online uh, open courses, which mean that wherever you're in the world, you can listen to and gain the intelligence and wisdom of great teachers, right? And it hasn't taken off as much as I expected it to because there is still a great deal of value to the physical activity of being in a university and engaging with other people. So, But for our students, MOOCs are wonderful because now they can get the very best in the world. The only problem there is it's all in English or most of it's in English. How do you do the mother tongue part? And that's where something that's come out recently, this is from Google, they got these earbuds, as you can see, these can translate 40 languages in real time. You put them on, somebody is speaking English and you can hear it in Hindi, for example. They're mentioning Hindi there. Now, there is a concern that this will be used to translate the other way, right? More than this way. That is, all these languages will be translated to English. But if we work on it, we should be able to harness this effectively for us. So I'm saying the same thing here. Now, the one other thing we need to be aware of is technology carries risks. You know, with AI, there are so many good things, but there is tremendous concern about the ethics of AI and the bias that can be built into AI unknowingly and unintended consequences. So technology is never a panacea, but it can be a helpful handmaid, in my opinion. So what is the solution? I claim that there are elements of our traditional curriculum that are very helpful, you know, what the Padashalas and the, and the great Gurukulas did. Um, much of what we know about traditional education comes from Dharampal, the great Gandhian who quoted the uh, original primary British documents. And this book, The Beautiful Tree, I would strongly recommend that all of you read it. It's available on the net. In fact, all of uh, Dharampal's books are available on the net. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Because when the British first came to India, they were in awe of the place. They're totally in awe. As we've heard you know, repeatedly, they're no longer in awe of us. They put us down. But then when they came there, we were so much better than them in every possible way, right? So they just 
dutifully noted all that and, and Dharampal quotes widely from them. Now, was his education useful? I'd say yes, it was. Panini's grammar that was written 2,500 years ago is the greatest grammar ever written. And it was reinvented by IBM um, computer types in the 1950s. They did, couldn't believe that it had been you know, invented by somebody many years ago. Infinite series by Mathava from my home state of Kerala. This is what resulted in the calculus and many other things besides. And Woods steel, we had nanocarbon steel. Okay, and all this is the result of education in the traditional mode. And what are the subjects according to Dharampal? Tarka, right? The ability to hold an argument. Vyakarana. Grammar is not dry and dull. It is extremely interesting because it makes you a full person and so forth. Rasa, Darshana, Arthashastra and Pramana. Epistemology we talked about in a couple of presentations earlier. So I have some details about why I think each of these topics is really going to be helpful for our young students. I'm not going to go through that. But for example, Arthashastra. If you talk to, um, it, I think it's our great, uh, um, you know, hidden weapon. Because white people don't know about Arthashastra. They all know about, Sun, they know about Sun Tzu. And in my opinion, Sun Tzu um, wrote a lot of, you know, poetry, which you can interpret any way you want. And then there is von Clausewitz, the great Prussian strategist. They only know those things. They do not know that Arthashastra exists, which is a tremendous uh, treatise on statecraft and economics. So it's a, it's a weapon that we should use as we go forward. Okay? And what I'm suggesting is not that we can overnight change the CBSE curriculum. It's not going to happen because there's too much vested in it. And, you know, imagine you're a parent and you go to them and say, tomorrow onwards you're gonna, your child is going to study Yaksa or uh, uh, Panini. They're going to kill you, right? So instead, you kind of, you know, slowly infiltrate this content into the existing curriculum, right? And um, there are many fringe benefits. I imagine that if people learn Sanskrit, they'll start getting curious about our heritage. And then the old uh, Kumaraswamy meme of, you know, colonized in the mind Indians will go away. Um, and I believe that uh, uh, the tyranny of English is going to be a thing of the past. And I'm going to give you some examples of the texts that Dharampal has identified, Dharampal has identified, and there's lots of them, I'm not going to read them, but, you know, for example, lexicology, Amarakosha, uh, etc. right? So these texts exist. You don't have to go invent them. You just have to revive them and make them available. So the in practice, what am I talking about? I'm talking about a pilot, okay, which could be an add-on to the existing curriculum. It should be highly personalized and it should be self-paced. That is, you don't have to be in front of the student. Student can be anywhere, right? It could be, in fact, it probably should be remote. And they can all use the MOOCs and, uh, and the uh, uh, data analytics and so forth to Five minutes? Yeah, thank you. And um, with that, we should be able to give them a very highly um, customized program. Second, and I think this is very important, because in India, education has become hands-off. You know, I studied engineering at IIT Madras, and uh, that's the last, the first and last time I've ever touched a machine tool, right? We don't do anything with our hands. That's wrong. We got to have that, you know, Doing things with your hands actually energizes your brain and makes you very creative. I teach, uh, for example, design thinking, which is a new management fad, if you will, that talks about doing things with your hands instead of being analytic. And I teach at IIM Bangalore, you know, in every course except mine, the first thing they do is whip out their laptops and fire up Excel and run some numbers. I'm like, do not bring your laptop to my class. You don't need it. You won't use it. Okay? You want to be creative. 